Equinus, The Basics, by Patrick Gay here, DPM. Disclosures. I am a principal of IQ Medical, and I am the inventor of the EQ-IQ brace. The Equinus Dilemma. You are not paying enough attention to it. Root et al. described Equinus as the worst foot in the world is the one with the fully compensated Equinus deformity. Johnson and Christensen described the Equinus deformity as the most profound causal agent in foot pathomechanics and is frequently linked to common foot pathology. Hill further described Equinus as Equinus deformity is extremely prevalent and it appears to be the primary causal agent in a significant proportion of foot pathology. There's a recurring theme through these uh, statements that the severity of Equinus and how it relates to foot pathology. Conditions that have been associated directly with Equinus in the literature, every single one of these pathologies has been directly linked to an Equinus underlying etiology. Equinus basics, we are going to discuss the associated conditions, the definition of Equinus, the anatomy involved with Equinus, the classification of Equinus, and finally, evaluation of Equinus. Equinus definition. Chaos is inherent in all compounded things. Strive on with diligence. Buddha. Equinus definition. Part of the confusion associated with Equinus is there's no absolute definition for it. Normal gait ankle joint dorsiflexion requirement for ambulation has been described in the literature to range from negative 10 degrees to plus 22 degrees. The consensus definition for equinus based on 13 different studies is plus 10 ankle joint dorsiflexion with the knee extended. Scarlato and Jatman, 1975, was the first to describe the subtalar joint neutral position and med midtarsal joint position being locked uh, with the knee extended of a plus 10 degrees definition for equinus. Trying to arrive at a, a formal definition of equinus that we can all work off of, there's been a, a very good study done by D. Giovanni et al. and JBJS 2002 that I think provides the definition that we can all work off and agree on. In their study, they had two groups of patients, a patient group and a control group. There were 34 patients in each group, and you can see the breakdown on the slide of the um, uh, demographics of the patients. For the patient group, there was a number of pathologies involved, from metatarsalgia all the way to stress fractures. Again, you can see the list of pathologies on the slide. Their group, they, had, uh, they looked at the amount of ankle joint dorsiflexion in each group. The patient group averaged 4.5 degrees of ankle joint dorsiflexion with the knee extended, while the control group averaged 13.1 degrees of ankle joint dorsiflexion with the knee extended. With the knee flexed, the patient group was 17.9 degrees, and the control group was 22.3 degrees. In this slide is a breakdown of the percent of patients in each group and how often they got the diagnosis correct for less than five degrees and less than 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. They compared clinical diagnosis utilizing a goniometer with a um, equinometer, which is a, a device hooked to a computer to formally uh, measure the amount of ankle joint dorsiflexion and confirm the goniometer measurement. So first, the number of patients or percent of patients in each group, less than five degrees for the patient or symptomatic group was 65%. For the control group was only 24%. Ankle joint dorsiflexion group, uh, less than 10 degrees was 88% for the patient group and 44% for the control group. The correct diagnosis with less than five degrees of ankle joint dorsiflexion was verified 76% of the time in the patient group and 94% of the time in the control group. And less than 10 degrees correct diagnosis was verified 88% of the time in the patient group and 79% of the time in the control group. This number should have been higher and there was no really explanation in the article about the difference in this number, but the trend is what is important. From the article from D. Giovanni et al. and JBJS 2002, it demonstrated that number one, patients with metatarsalgia or related forefoot and or midfoot symptoms had less average maximal ankle joint dorsiflexion with a knee and extension than it did 
a control population without foot symptoms. And number two, when the knee is flexed at 90 degrees to relax the gastrocnemius, this difference was no longer present. Continuing from the article, we have selected less than five degrees of maximal ankle joint dorsiflexion with a knee in full extension as our definition because it allowed us to diagnose the problem in those who were at risk, symptomatic patients, with fairly good reproducibility, 76%, and more importantly, we are able to reliably avoid, in 94% of the cases, unnecessary treatment of those people who are not at risk, asymptomatic people. So the, the definition I think we, we should be working off of is less than uh, five degrees ankle joint dorsiflexion with a knee extended. That allows us to get most of the patients who have symptoms and more importantly, avoid patients who don't need treatment almost 100% of the time. Continuing from this article, their definition according to the article for gastroc equinus was ankle joint dorsiflexion less than five degrees with a knee extended. That was about three quarters of their symptomatic patients and about only a quarter of the control group. For gastroc soleus equinus, the definition was ankle joint dorsiflexion less than 10 degrees with the knee flexed at 90 degrees, which for, accounted for approximately a third of the symptomatic patients and a sixth of the control group. The other finding from the article was that clinical examination was demonstrated to be fairly reliable in identifying muscle tightness. And finally from the article, although our data are clearly preliminary, such findings may have implications for preventative care and should heighten awareness of the existence and potential long-term effects of tightness of the calf muscles, particularly the gastrocnemius muscle, in patients without neurological impairment. We suspect that this pathological entity plays a vital role in chronic mechanical breakdown or inflammation of both the foot and ankle. Anatomy of triceps surae, triceps surae anatomy. The Achilles tendon is the strongest, thickest, largest tendon in the body, approximately 15 centimeters in length. It inserts into the posterior middle one-third of the calcaneus with a retrocalcaneal bursa between the two at the proximal one-third of the calcaneus. The course, the superficial posterior compartment. The Achilles fibers spiral laterally about 90 degrees. The gastroc fibers insert principally on the lateral aspect of the calcaneus, and the soleus fibers insert principally on the medial aspect of the calcaneus. There's a tendon sheath that allows for sliding of the tendon, and a peritinon which is deep to the tendon sheath to protect and nourish the tendon. The blood supply is from the myotendinous junction, the peritinon, and the calcaneal periosteum. There is a zone of hypovascularity, approximately four to five centimeters cephalad from the insertion, and this is a common area for Achilles tendon ruptures. Continuing with triceps anatomy, the gastrocnemius muscle crosses the knee joint, the ankle joint, and the subtalar joint, which is why much of the tightness is associated with this muscle directly, the, is from equinus. The origin of the gastrocnemius muscle is the posterior aspect of the femoral condyles, the medial head is larger and the muscle fibers descend further distally. The muscle also originates from the posterior knee capsule uh, as it arches over the popliteal vessels and tibial nerve. The aponeurosis is anterior to the muscle. It's innervated by the tibial nerve. Its arterial supplies are sural branches from the popliteal artery. And the action of the gastrocnemius muscles to supply power for propulsion, plantar flexion of the ankle joint, and knee flexion. Triceps surae anatomy, soleus muscle. The soleus crosses the ankle joint and subtalar joint both. The origin, the head, and proximal one-third of the posterior fibula, the middle one-third of the medial border of the tibia, and the soleal line and interosseous membrane. The aponeurosis is posterior to the muscle. It's innervated by the tibial nerve. The posterior tibial artery, perineal artery, and sural artery provide arterial supply. The action, it's 80% type one slow twitch fibers that provide stabilization of the leg on the foot. It also provides ankle joint plantar flexion. The plantaris muscle can be absent approximately 7% of the time. Its origin is, a, is medial and above the lateral head of the gastroc at the lateral condyle of the femur, 
coursing lateral to medial. It inserts on the medial to the Achilles tendon in the central one-third of the posterior aspect of the calcaneus. How frequent is Aquinas? Hill looked at the frequency of Aquinas in Jatman in 1995. In their study, they looked at 209 new patients over six weeks. 26 patients were deleted because their primary complaint did not fit into study guidelines. For example, they had a nail problem, a verrucous lesion, or other type of uh, skin condition. Six of the remaining 174 patients had normal ankle joint dorsiflexion. They had 168 patients with Aquinas, three with gastroc, 165 with gastroc soleal Aquinas. The range was from nine years old to 85 years old with a mean of 48.2 years of age. Their definition for Aquinas in their study was relatively strict. It was less than three degrees ankle joint dorsiflexion with a knee extended. The findings showed 96.5% of patients with foot or ankle pathology exhibited equinus deformity. This is from Hill's article showing a breakdown of the patients per category of foot complaints divided into rear foot pain, medial foot pain, lateral foot pain, and mixed group pain. And you can see from the breakdown, the majority of the patients had heel pain or with or without a heel spur. Metatarsalgia was also high on the lesser metatarsal problems, but this uh, list breaks down the, the patients from the study. Continuing from Hill's article in Jatman 1995, the podiatric physician should look beyond the specific complaint to diagnose the underlying cause. Frequently, ankle equinus deformity will be at the root of the patient's foot problem. Gastroc soleus stretching was found to be an effective modality in treating a wide range of podiatric complaints where ankle equinus is an underlying etiologic factor. Continuing from Hill's article, treating apparent biomechanical problems that have an underlying equinus deformity with rigid functional orthoses is a major reason for unsuccessful orthotic treatment. Equinus patients who receive orthoses as their sole treatment may not be capable of accepting orthotic control. A rigid orthotic will prevent the foot from pronating, and the result is arch irritation from excess friction against the orthoses. If you have patients that have difficulty with their orthoses, oftentimes there is an underlying equinus that hasn't been treated. Uh, very rarely is the orthotic the problem. Um, the compensation that we'll get into for equinus later in the lecture uh, will show that the plantar flexion that occurs through the navicular cuneiform joint uh, with a deforming force of, of the leg onto the foot can cause significant orthotic irritation and uh, make it difficult for patients to tolerate a, a rigid corrective um, orthoses. Uh, however, if you can stretch the patient and treat them uh, appropriately prior to putting them in orthoses, uh, you will notice significant improvement with your orthotic outcomes. Equinus classification. Aquinas classification can be broke down into muscular, which is further subdivided into either spastic deformity or non-spastic deformities. Spastic deformities can be a gastroc equinus or gastroc soleal equinus. Non-spastic deformities can also be either gastroc equinus or gastroc soleal equinus. The other type of equinus can be osseous, which can be seen with a tibiotalar exostosis, osseous bridging between the tibia and fibula, a pseudo-Aquinas, pseudo-Aquinas is associated with a cavus foot, essentially because of the high calcaneal inclination angle and the forefoot being plantar flex relative to the rear foot. The ankle joint dorsiflexes to get the forefoot and rear foot on the same plane, utilizing the ankle joint dorsiflexion available, giving what is an apparent pseudo-Aquinas. And finally, a combination Aquinas can be a combination of muscular Aquinas with an osseous Aquinas, uh, together. Shows x-rays showing examples of different types of Aquinas. First is the tibiotalar exostosis, also commonly known as footballer's ankle. You can see the spurring in the anterior aspect of the ankle joint with a stress lateral view causing impingement and restriction of ankle joint dorsiflexion. And the left x-ray. On the right x-ray shows a cavus foot deformity with a severe high uh, calcaneal inclination angle um, and ankle joint dorsiflexion to help get the forefoot parallel to the rear foot and uh, on the weight bearing surface, therefore utilizing the available ankle joint dorsiflexion creating the pseudo equinus deformity as depicted on the x-ray on the right. Equinus evaluation. If you're not confused, you're not paying attention. Tom Peters, author. Equinus
Aquinas evaluation confusion. I've worked for a long time as the uh, podiatrist for the Indiana Pacers, and I think every player has Aquinas. The trainers think zero of the players have Aquinas, and some of that is because of a lack of uh, agreement on definition and understanding of the deformity, but being able to have a definition that we can all work off of and having some understanding about the, the, the deformity uh, I think can bring all specialties together to further uh, understand this condition and allow us then to treat it adequately and help prevent injuries that can occur from equinus. So when we're talking about equinus evaluation, some questions we need to answer are should we measure weight bearing or non-weight bearing? Should the knee be flexed or extended? Should it be an active or passive measurement? Should the patient be seated, supine, prone, or standing? How should we measure it with a goniometer or should we use something else? What are our landmarks that we're working off of? And what should we be measuring? Is it just strict ankle joint dorsiflexion or is there part of the dorsiflexion uh, from the foot? And does it all matter clinically is the bigger question. How does it relate to our clinical findings and the pathology that the patient exhibits? These are questions that have led to the confusion of body quietness over the years. And answering some of these questions with literature, I think can help lead us to common ground on equinus. Equinus evaluation, what are we measuring? First, the ankle joint was originally thought to be the primary producer of foot dorsiflexion. The axis of motion follows the center of the tips of the malleoli obliquely downward and laterally. Leonardi et al. and Perry et al. showed a triplanar motion with a single degree of freedom at the ankle joint, primarily an ankle joint dorsiflexion, from neutral to 25 degrees of dorsiflexion. However, there was noted to be four degrees of supination and six degrees of external rotation of the lower extremity as well. And Madeline et al. used MRI to evaluate the rear foot non-weight bearing range of motion and showed that the Taylor movement was biplanar. There wasn't a negligible amount of eversion within the ankle joint. The ankle joint complex dorsiflexion is actually a summation of multiple joints. You have the ankle joint dorsiflexion. Subtalar joint pronation causes the calcaneus to dorsiflex relative to the tibia as well. And Lundberg et al. in foot and ankle in 1989 looked at the motion of the ankle joint and subtalar joint combined and showed 10 degrees of dorsiflexion occurred, 5.9 plus or minus 2.3 degrees occurred at the talocrural ankle joint with the remaining dorsiflexion occurring at the subtalar joint, so they showed a fair amount of dorsiflexion occurring at the subtalar joint as well. There has also been shown to be midfoot dorsiflexion. Lundgren et al. and gait and posture in 2008 showed a combined motion of the three medial arch joints relative to the talus was 17.6 degrees in the sagittal plane, which was greater than that of the tibial talar joint of 15.3 degrees. So there's more dorsiflexion occurring within the midfoot than actually at the ankle joint. And the question becomes, do we want midfoot dorsiflexion occurring during ambulation, or do we want the foot to function as a rigid lever at mid stance and toe off as it should? Um, and should we take this into account uh, with evaluation, the amount of dorsiflexion that's occurring at the midfoot? In personal communication with Kevin Kirby, DPM, he wrote back to me via email, podiatric medicine standard clinical measurement for ankle joint dorsiflexion is not a good measurement of talotibial, i.e. ankle joint dorsiflexion, since the subtalar joint, the midtarsal joint, and the midfoot joints all contribute to altering our quote-unquote ankle joint dorsiflexion measurements. A better term would probably be ankle foot dorsiflexion rather than just ankle joint dorsiflexion for our standard clinical measurement for ankle joint dorsiflexion. So as you can see, just measuring the amount of dorsiflexion within the ankle foot unit is actually much more complicated than we'd originally thought. Root et al., normal and abnormal function of the foot in 1977 or described ankle joint dorsiflexion measurement utilizing a goniometer with one arm along the lateral bisection of the lower leg and the other arm parallel to the lateral aspect of the foot from the heel to the fifth metatarsal. The subtalar joint was put in neutral position and the midtarsal joint was locked while applying a dorsiflexion force to the foot. Equinus evaluation. Goniometer measurements, however, have been shown to be unreliable with poor reducibility. Several articles have questioned the use of goniometer as shown on the slide. 
The other question with measuring ankle joint dorsiflexion is what is the reliability of the practitioner to put the subtalar joint in neutral position? And this has also been questioned through several articles as shown on the slide, as well as the midfoot position importance in equinus evaluation. And the references for these articles are shown on this slide. Silver Skold originally described ankle joint evaluation in his uh, landmark article in 1924. No equinus showed ankle joint dorsiflexion with a knee extended greater than five degrees above 90. And the ankle joint dorsiflexion with a knee flex at 90 was greater than 10 degrees above 90. Gastroc equinus was defined as ankle joint dorsiflexion with a knee less than five degrees above 90. And ankle joint dorsiflexion with a knee flex at 90 degrees was described as greater than 10 degrees with the foot above 90 degrees. Finally, gastroc soleus equinus or osseous equinus is described as ankle joint dorsiflexion with a knee extended of less than five degrees above 90 and ankle joint dorsiflexion with a knee flexed at 90 degrees of less than 10 degrees above 90 degrees. The video analysis of uh, clinical evaluation of equinus on a pediatric patient. I've marked the landmarks, the lateral malleus and the lateral border of the foot and you can see dorsiflexion with the subtalar joint in neutral and the midtarsal joint supinated to lock the midtarsal joint. This patient is a teenage boy who is an excellent football player and very tight calves who actually was a toe walker as an infant, so he's very tight um, with significant amount of limitation of ankle joint dorsiflexion. Um, I typically don't really use a goniometer. I kind of eye it when I'm clinically examining the foot but here's the use of the goniometer to get an exact measurement, as exact as a goniometer will allow. Equinus evaluation. Gatt and Cockleanham in JAPMA 2011 described the main objective of this structured literature review were to investigate whether alternative techniques to goniometric measurements exist for routine clinical measurement of ankle joint dorsiflexion and to determine how valid and reliable they are, concentrating mainly on non-surgically induced limited ankle joint dorsiflexion. So this article is a meta-analysis review of ankle joint dorsiflexion that is non-neurologically related. They looked at techniques for measuring ankle joint dorsiflexion and, and looked at 87 different articles that met their criteria. First, utilizing conventional methods, which consisted of a goniometer, lunge test, and visual examination. Then they looked at more sophisticated methods, which were electrogoniometers and potentiometers, uh, inclinometers, gravity goniometers, lateral radiographs, 2D video photography. And finally, specifically design methods, which include dynometers, torque range of motion devices, limb comb template and modified limb comb template, biplane goniometer, manually controlled instrumented foot plate, equinometer, mechanical equinometer, Iowa ankle device, and other custom apparatus devices. Continuing from this article from GATT and JATMA 2011, Subject positioning can affect ankle dorsiflexion. Uh, they looked at positioning of the patient supine prone, sitting supine, knee flexed, and knee extended. And the amount of force applied, the moment or torque, the distance between the axis of movement of the ankle axis and the point where application of the force ranged anywhere from 10 to 25 newtons per meter. And then Di Giovanni et al. used in their study showed that 10 newtons per meter based on studies that showed the average torque that was applied to the foot during examination from their examiners. Continuing from Gatt's article in Jatman 2011, foot positioning was shown that the subtalar joint in neutral position, the importance of the pronation increased sagittal plane motion, which hides in true diagnosis of equinus and that subtalar joint neutral position prevents dorsiflexion through the midfoot providing more accurate diagnosis of equinus. Tiberio et al. showed that 10 degrees of variation between pronated and non-pronated feet occur for ankle joint dorsiflexion dependent upon subtalar joint positioning and Woodburn marked ankle joint dorsiflexion difference between pronated and supinated and neutral feet. So having the subtalar joint in neutral position has been shown to be critical uh, when you're evaluating for equinus. And then they looked at validated reference standards, 
which um, have been described as uh, primarily lateral radiographs of the foot, which measure along the bisection of the fibula and tailored trochlear measurements. And this has been verified by Becker and Kofood and JBJS in 1989. And continuing from this article by Gad and Jatma, 2011, most devised instruments consistently produce the same results in healthy populations. There is still no total agreement as how the foot dorsiflexion angle can be measured. The various techniques are inconsistent. Furthermore, it is not clear what is being measured, whether it's tibio-tailor joint motion, ankle joint complex motion, or summation of all the movements of the joints of the foot. And it seems that the latter may be most likely, thus the term foot dorsiflexion may be more appropriate. Continuing from Gatt's article in Chapman, 2011, it is being proposed that the following variables be standardized, placement of the vertical arm, use of a plate for the other arm, and the amount of force applied to dorsiflex the foot, currently 10 to 20 newtons per meter. Unless a true standardization of measurement is achieved, the accuracy of communication between clinicians, the act of measuring ankle joint dorsiflexion, and the accuracy of measuring the measurement itself, which is important in determining therapeutic options, will be sorely lacking. Furthermore, the research that is going on cannot be responsibly used. It seems that even in this day and age, ankle joint complex dorsiflexion measurement is still a gray area. Conclusions. Ankle joint dorsiflexion definition, I think we can base it off D. Giovanni's findings in JBJS of 2002. And if we use less of greater than five degrees of ankle joint dorsiflexion with a knee extended as our baseline definition, so less than five degrees of ankle joint dorsiflexion with a knee extended would be considered pathologic. Equinus contributes to most foot and lower extremity biomechanically related pathology based on Hill's article in Chapman, 1995. Equinus treatment should be part of any overall treatment plan that equinus is part of the pathological condition. And there is no good way to measure equinus in the clinical setting, but using a goniometer with a subtalar joint in neutral position and the midfoot lock seems to be the most practical way. Feel free to email me with questions regarding this lecture at padeher, D-E-H-E-E-R, at sbcglobal.net. Thank you.